Okay, good morning, everyone. It is so nice to have a chance to learn together again. And today we are in for a very big treat with our Erev Shabbos Parsha inspiration. And today I'm here to tell you some good news. Number one, that money does grow on trees. Number two, that horses can count. And that number three is that we get to be like Hashem. Those are the three ideas I want to share with you today. Again, money does grow on trees. Horses do count. And we get to be like Hashem. As we do every Friday morning, we do three ideas in 30 minutes. Here we go. Let's start. Erev Shabbos. I cannot wait. I hope you guys can as well join me for the ride. All right. Money does grow on trees. We all know that as a child, that is something that our parents tell us to make us feel guilty about spending money. Phil, don't you know money doesn't grow on trees? How could you have bought that? How could you have spent that? Well, I got news for you. Money does grow on trees. Now, how do I know that money grows on trees? And I say it so confidently. The answer is because it's a Gemara. And the Gemara tells us, V'amar Rav Hoshaya, B'sha'asheh b'na Shlomo Beis HaMikdash, that when Shlomo HaMelech built the Beis HaMikdash, Nata ba kol minei megadim shel zav, he planted all of these golden golden trees, essentially, Bahayu motzian peiroseim bizmanam. And these golden trees would literally motzian peiroseim. They would bear golden fruit in the right time. And so anyone who ever tells you that money does not grow on trees, I want you to share with them this Gemara. And I want you to tell them that Rabbi Moskowitz told me that money does grow on trees. Now, obviously, we have to understand that. What exactly is the Gemara talking about? And why is it that it's describing golden trees and golden trees that bear fruit to golden fruit, literally money growing on trees? The answer, my friends, comes from our Parsha that we're going to read tomorrow morning. Because there the Pasuk says, V'nasata al shulchan lechem panim, Lifanai tamid, the lechem apanim. So we know that the bread that was put on the shulchan from one era of Shabbos to the next era of Shabbos, it was miraculous in that it never grew stale. It was just as fresh at the beginning as it was at the end. An enormous miracle. Now we know that there were lots of miracles that took place in the Beis HaMikdash. And yet, as we talked about a number of weeks ago, this miracle clearly surpassed them all. And the reason why I know this miracle surpassed them all is because the Gemara elsewhere tells us that when the Ole Regalim, that when people would come to the Beis HaMikdash for the Shlosh Regalim, and the rabbis wanted to wow everyone with the miracles of the Beis HaMikdash, you know which miracle they choose? They chose this miracle of the Lechem HaPanim. Shemag so they used to lift it up. Umarin bo Ole Regalim Lechem HaPanim, they would show everyone this showbread. Ve'amru lahem ra'u chibaschem lifnei makom see how much Hashem loves you. Now, we spoke about this in a different context a different a few weeks ago. But here's my question for us this morning. Out of all the miracles that we could have highlighted to the people who came to the Beis Amigdash, why specifically do we choose the miracle of the Lechma Panim? Very simple question. Let me share with you a beautiful Ishbitzer of Yaakov Leiner, the second Ishbitzer Rebbe. Get a little start off with some, some good Hasidus this morning. Says the Ishbitzer Rebbe something magnificent, you will never forget it, I promise you. He says, right, I'll read it again in Hebrew and then I'll translate it. That because it was placed constantly before Hashem, it never grew stale, it never grew old. Says the Yishbet Rebbe something beautiful. How is it that the Lechma Panim would be so miraculous and that it would stay fresh from one Friday all the way to the other Friday that defies the laws of nature. Don't try it in your own home, right? If you take last week's challah out this Shabbos, it will not be a very nice Shabbos. I can promise you that. And yet in the base of English, it happened. How did it happen? How did this miracle take place? It says the Ishbet Rebbe something very beautiful. That something that is constantly connected to Hashem never grows stale and never grows old something that's constantly connected to its creator, something that's constantly connected to its source will always remain fresh and will always remain alive. And we know this to be true, not just when it comes to the Lechem HaPanim and the Beis HaMikdash, we know this to be true in general, that when something is connected to its source, so it will live, it will grow, and it will flourish. The second you disconnect it from that source, so it's simply a matter of time until it will wither, and until it would die, right? This Monday, I'm sorry, this Sunday, oh, but better not get it off by a day. This Sunday is Mother's Day, 
right? Time to buy flowers. Now you and I both know that flowers are ridiculous. And the reason why flowers are ridiculous, women don't, yeah, I'm hearing a lot of shaking heads. There are many things in life I understand, flowers will never be one of them. And for the following reason, that the second you cut the flowers from the ground, it's simply counting down until they wither away and die. I never understood flowers. I'd rather buy my wife something that's everlasting. Flowers, they're here one day, they're gone the next. And the reason why they're, oh, I'm making a lot of enemies right now this morning. And the reason why they're here one day, gone the next, is because we know that the second you cut them from the ground, the second you remove it from its source, it's simply a matter of time until it's going to wither, until it's going to die out. Therefore, says the Ishbitz Rebbe, what kept the lechem upon him so deliciously fresh, what made it that it was just as fresh one Friday as it was to the next Friday, is the fact that if you look at the Pasuk, it says, lefanai tamid, is that it was always before Hashem. <laughs> Someone just posted, Rabbi is right, jewelry lasts longer. Yeah, things that last longer also cost more. Diamonds are forever, right? Baharaya, that's the proof, okay? Says the Ishbit Sarebi, that what kept the lechem upon him so fresh is dafka, the fact that the Pasuk tells us that it was lefanai tamid, that it was always connected to its source, that it was always connected to Hashem. Says the Ishbitz Rebbe, and I promise you, you will never forget this Ishbitz Rebbe. Says the Ishbitz Rebbe of Yaakov Liner, what's true of plants, and what's true of vegetation, and what's true of the Lechem Apanim, is true for a Jew as well. It's true for a Jewish person as well. Means that as a Jew, so long as we keep ourselves connected to Hashem, so we're going to be alive and vibrant and growing. So long as we remain connected to Hashem, so our Judaism will never grow stale, it will never grow old, it will never grow moldy. It's only when we create a separation between us and Hashem that our Judaism will be able to age, will start to age and it will start to wither. And so the vibrancy, the dynamism of our Judaism has nothing to do with age. It has nothing to do with stage of life. You know what it has to do with? How much we can keep ourselves connected to the source. How long we can keep ourselves connected to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. The more we yearn and the more we strive to connect ourselves to Hashem, the more our Judaism is alive, it's vibrant, it's dynamic. The more we create a difference, distance between us and Hashem. Then like that stale moldy bread, like the flowers that you cut from the source, that's what is going to become of our Judaism as well. Now, I promised you, that money grows on trees. The Gemara tells us money grows on trees. How did that happen? Says the Ishbitz Rebbe, something very beautiful, right? That of all the miracles, we celebrate the Lechem Apanim. And the reason why we do it is very simple. Is that if in Lechem Apanim, if something that's connected to its source can constantly grow, then trees that are found in the base of Migdash, all the more so. He says, Mikomakom. You know what allowed this inanimate object, this golden tree, something so absurd to bear fruit? It's specifically It was the fact that it was in the Beis Hamikdash before Hashem. And that's why the Gemara goes on to say that when Nebuchadnezzar comes into the Beis Hamikdash and he destroys the Beis Hamikdash, that's when the tree stopped bearing fruit. Because Hashem had removed himself from the Beis Hamikdash in the moment Hashem removed himself from the base of Migdash, the source was gone. There was no more rain and there was no more fertile ground surrounding the, the flowers. It withers away. The tree stopped bearing fruit. And so says the Ishbitz Rebbe, by telling us that this golden tree was able to bear fruit, it's reinforcing this notion in such an absurd way that when something is connected to its source, when something is connected to Hashem, it's able to grow. It's able to remain vibrant. It's able to be dynamic. The second you cut it from that source, that's when it starts to grow old and wither and stay and wither and stale. And so message number one for us on this beautiful, cold Friday morning, I don't know about you, I needed a sweatshirt last night in Boca Raton. Message number one is, is that if we want our Judaism to be alive, if we want our Judaism to be passionate and filled with excitement, then we have to always strive to remain connected to Hashem, connected to the source, through davening and through learning, the moment we create that separation, then we are like the flowers on Sunday night of Mother's Day. We are about to grow old and wither 
and stale and die out. Let's be like the flowers on Sunday morning, not like the flowers on Sunday night. That's message number one. Beautiful. I think it's a magnificent idea from the Ishbitz Rebbe from our Parsha. Message number two is somewhat of an outgrowth of message number one, also a beautiful idea. And from this, we'll go from Hasidish to Litvish with a beautiful idea from Ramosha Feinstein. Ramosha Feinstein points out the very famous first pasuk of this week's parsha, Vayomer Hashem Moshe, and more, El HaKohanim B'nei Aaron Ve'amarta Lehem. There is a redundancy in the pasuk, Amor Ve'amarta. Why do you need to say it twice? You don't need to be a rocket scientist to have figured out that question. It could have only told me, Amor El HaKohanim B'nei Aaron, and then tell me exactly what they wanted to say. Why does it need Amor and Ve'amarta? The answer says Ramosha Feinstein, it's such a beautiful answer. He says, there are many times in the Torah where the Torah tells us to educate our children and to educate our grandchildren. There aren't as many times in the Torah where the Torah tells me how it is that I'm supposed to educate them. It very rarely unlocks that lesson for me. Says Ramosha Feinstein, this week's Parsha is not just to educate our children, but it tells us how to educate our children. And that's the Amor and the Amarta. You see, Amor tells us that I need to teach my children. I need to transmit information to them. I need to instill a sense of misora, a sense of tradition, a sense of connection to previous generations. And more means that my children need to know the ABCs of Judaism. They need to know about Hilcho Shabbos and about Borer and about Shatnez and about Kilayim. They need to know the, 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 the ABs and Cs, X, Ys, and Zs of Judaism. What does the Amarta come along and tell me, says Ramosha Feinstein? Amarta come along and tells me the attitude that I need to have when it is that I'm teaching my children. Listen to these amazing words of Ramosha Feinstein. He says, amiros. You need two Amiros. One is to teach me again the, the, the X, Ys, and Zs, the A, B, and Cs of Judaism. Borer and Shatnez and Shabbos, all of that. Visheni. And you know what the second Ve'amarta communicates to us? She'yiyeh chaviv. I need to communicate to my children just how precious this is. Umizeh yishanachu. And it's from that second Ve'amarta that I will ultimately be zoche to educate them. It's not just transmitting information, but says Ramosha and more in Ve'amarta tells us that it's how we communicate that information which is just as, if not more, important. And here's where I come to point number two, which are horses that can count. My favorite study in the entire planet, you guys have probably heard me quote it many times, is the story in 1891, I wasn't born yet, of clever Hans. Hans was a horse, a horse that Germans had concluded could count. And the reason why they concluded he can count is because every time they would give him a mathematical equation, Hans, what is four plus three? And they would get to the number seven and Hans would start going crazy. And they would know that Hans would know how to count. And they tried it over and over and over again. And sure enough, Hans would be able to count every single time. No one could figure it out. It baffled scientists, people, th no one could figure it out. Finally, in the er early 1900s, a group of researchers said to themselves, this just can't be. There's no way horses can count. And therefore, they tried to manipulate the study just a little bit. Instead of giving Hans the numerical um, equation while he was seeing them, they hid behind a wall and spoke to Hans. So now the horse couldn't see them, he could only hear them. And sure enough, Hans got the equation wrong every single time. And what they found was, is that Hans could not count. But what he was very attuned to was unconscious cues from the person who was asking the question. And so in videotaping afterwards, what they realized is that when you would give Hans a mathematical equation, four plus three, and you would come to the number seven, so you would say, Hans, is the number answer one? Is the answer two? Is the answer three? When you would come to the number seven, they noticed that in a very, very, very slight subconscious way, the trainer would lean forward a little bit or his eyes would twitch a little bit, or his ears would perk up a little bit. And Hans was picking up on these unconscious cues, and he would know 
which one was different from all the others, and you would be able to say which is the correct answer. And researchers use this to show and applied it to human beings subsequently that whether we realize it or not, we are constantly communicating unconscious cues when we talk to each other. And so while when you might see me in the supermarket and I think I might be faking how excited I am to see you, of course, I'm always happy to see you, I'm just using it as an example, right? Really, there are subconscious things that are taking place in my facial expression, in the tone of my voice, in my body, the way I conduct myself, that's communicating a lot more about how I feel about you and your conversation, more so than anything that I'm saying. And you and I both know that's true, and every week is that we talk to someone. You can tell just as much by their face, by their body, um, how tense they are, how relaxed they are, They're, right? We could tell a lot more about that. I took this idea of Clever Hans, and I think it's exactly what Ramosha Feinstein is telling us. Ramosha Feinstein is telling us is that there's an Amor and there's an Amarta. There's an Amor, there's the actual instruction that we need to have for our children, our grandchildren. We need to make sure that they get an education and they know halacha and that they know the do's and don'ts of Judaism. But just as important, if not more, says Ramosha Feinstein, is the unconscious cues that we give our children when it comes to Judaism and when it comes to Torah study. Our children will sense not just what it is that we're telling them, but how it is that we're telling it to them. Are we passionate? Are we excited? Are we dreary when we're talking about it? Is it a, uh, I have to do this? Do they sense whether it's a priority or not a priority from us? All of these things that we think we're faking, our children and our grandchildren, and you and I know this better than anyone else, are very good at picking up on unconscious cues. Our kids are very, I'll tell, my kids are very quick to know whether I really care about something or whether I'm just doing it because I wanna put a check on a checkbox, right? I was talking to a group of dads the other day. Nowhere do I think this is more prevalent than during the quarantine, during social distancing, no minyanim. And some of the dads were lamenting, my children, uh, how do you get your children to daven, right? The schools have to do more to force our children to daven. They have to put in a system of rewards and punishment in place. And then one of the other dads perked up and he said, I, I think it's pretty simple, right? Like if you get up and daven every morning and you care about it, and right, again, this doesn't apply as much to teenagers. I get that. I have younger children, right? But children get that very quick sense of, do my parents care about this or is it a burden, right? Is this a check on a checklist or is this something that we're going to do even if it's voluntary and no one's putting a gun to my head and forcing me to do it, right? That's the clever Hans mentality. It's not just that we're communicating information, says Ramosha, but it's how we communicate that information. It's the excitement, the enthusiasm, the passion that we use to communicate that information. It's whether our children and our grandchildren see that this is something that we do as a burden or something that we do because the greatest privilege in the world. It's a question I ask myself all the time, and I really do. And my wife and I talk about this, right? If I could be born again, if I could start all over, would I choose Judaism, right? Would I choose all of the 613 mitzvahs, all of the restrictions, is this something that I would choose if I could start it all over again? And I want you to know my answer was yes before quarantine. It's yes times a hundred now. Because my son looked at me the other day. I hope he's not watching. Abby, don't rat him out. But my son looked at me the other day. He goes, dad, I just don't understand what life would look like without Shabbos. Like, I don't understand. Like my kids now crave that day when technology is off. They're so beholden to Zooms in Google Chats, in Google Classrooms, right? Their entire life now is online. So my children now are getting a glimpse into what our lives are like, right? We for years have appreciated what it's like to turn off our cell phones. But my children now are getting a glimpse into how beautiful it is to be able to shut down technology and to just be and to experience family. So yes, right? My, I hope, I try every day and I, I, I really put a mirror to myself, right? Am I doing this because I have to? Or am I doing it because I love it and I get to? Not because I have to, but because I want to. And that's lesson number two from Moshe Feinstein. And more of Amarta, it's not just what we teach, but it's how we teach. Lesson number three from this week's Parsha, it's a question that's always bothered me. We say by Sviras Omer, right? Sviras Omer is not only in this week's Parsha, but it's also in, it's also the time period that we are in. Abby Rosenblatt, your dad heard this idea. He can tell you about it more. You guys could have a chavrus about it. Here we go. When it comes to Sfiras Omer, we know there's a very strange pasuk in the parsha, Usfartem Lachem, that you're supposed to count, Mimacharat Hashabbat, from the day after Shabbos. 
Now, we are used to the fact that we can't always take what the Torah says at face value, right? There's something called Torah Shabal Peh, okay? So for example, ayin tachas ayin, shein tachas shein, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. We know that doesn't really mean I get to punch out your tooth, right? We mean that there's a financial responsibility that I have if I call, cause you damage, right? So here, we're used to the fact that words don't always mean what they literally say in the Torah. And yet out of all the examples, Mimacharat HaShabbat has created the greatest controversies in all Jewish history because there were Karaites throughout history that read it as Mimacharat HaShabbat. Yeah, you start counting Svira Omer from the day after Shabbos. Svira Omer is always going to be counted after a Sunday. Now we know that's not true. We know that Gemara tells us that Mimacharat HaShabbat means what? It means the day after the first day of Pesach, second day of Pesach. Second night of Pesach is when we start counting Sviras Omer. Couldn't the Chazal, couldn't the Torah, Hashem, make it easy for us, cut us a break. I just spoke about, I'm happy about the 613 mitzvahs, but can you make it a little bit easier for me? You have to put me through a, you know, a whole maze to get to this concept that you count Sviras Omer from the day after Pesach. Why couldn't it just said, Usvartem lachem, bayom sheni shel Pesach. It would have avoided so much machlokes, so much controversy, what is it with Mimacharas HaShabbas? So I saw a beautiful idea. This is from Rabbi Yitzchak Tversky, who is a, a magnificent Tanakh teacher. He lives in Israel. I think he used to be a Rebbe at Frisch in uh, New Jersey, but he lives in Israel. His Tanakh stuff is gorgeous. He says the following idea. He says, if you think about numbers, numbers are important here. The number seven in Judaism represents nature. It's what God creates, right? What's the greatest example of this Shabbos? The seven days of creation. Seven represents nature. Seven represents what God creates in the world. The number eight represents that which is above nature. And in this case, it's that which mankind builds upon Hashem's nature. It represents our input into creation. So seven is what God creates. The number eight is what we add on and what we partner with Hashem to continue to build upon creation. What's the greatest example of this? Brismila. Right, Bismillah doesn't happen on the seventh day. It happens specifically on the eighth day. And the reason the Medrash says why Bismillah happens on the eighth day, why wasn't mankind created, circumcised? Right, the Medrash says very famously, Afilu Adam Tsarich Tikkun. The Medrash goes through that all these things in the world, take wheat, for example. Wheat isn't given to us as a final product. Hashem gives us the raw product, and it's our job to partner with Hashem in the creation of wheat. Right? That's what makes bread. It makes challah. Challah is not as exciting if it's just raw wheat. We partner with Hashem in it. Right? Says the Medrash, Afilu Adam Tzarech Tikkun. Even mankind needs a Tikkun. In other words, even we needed to partner with Hashem to improve our imperfect world. So now let's come back to Mimacharat HaShabbat. Right? Now let's come back to this. By the way, parenthetically, that's why if you think about it, every Jewish ritual that we have surrounds two food items grape juice or wine, and challah. What is unique about those two? That they are both things that are incomplete that we have to make into their final product. Right, Hashem gives us grapes. Grapes are easy. I could plant seeds in the ground. And then God brings rain, bada bing, bada boom, right? What makes grape juice and wine so spectacular is that I have to take what Hashem gave me and I have to put my own stamp on it. I have to harvest it and ferment it. I have to do all those steps. Challah is the same thing, right? Wheat is easy. What makes bread so spectacular is I have to take that wheat and I have to put my own effort into it. I have to put my, my own stamp on that bread. So every Jewish ritual, Shabbos, Yontif, weddings, right? It all has to do with wine and challah because that's where Kedusha comes. Kedusha comes out of not just what Hashem hands us on a silver platter, but Kedusha comes from what Hashem gives us and that we build upon to continue to improve his world. Right now, let's come back to the Omer. Why does it say Mimacharat Hashabbat? It would have been so much easier to just say on the second day of Pesach, we would have made it so much easier for us, so much easier for so many generations of Jews. The answer is it's giving us a whole different dimension. Right? You have to read the words literally. Again, if the number seven, if Shabbos represents nature, then Mimacharat Hashabbat, the day after Shabbos, represents what? It represents the eighth day. It represents that what happens after the number seven. This is such a beautiful idea. 
right? Seven represents what God hands to us on a silver platter. Mimacharat Shabbat, what comes after Shabbos, the number eight represents that which we build upon from what Hashem gives us. It's asking ourselves the question, what can I give back? It's asking ourselves the question, what can I contribute? And so instead of sitting back with a pina colada on a hammock, Svira challenges us, it empowers us. And it says, don't ask what Hashem can do for you, but ask what you can do for Hashem. I saw the other day, I'm going to write about it in a little bit, but I saw the other day that researchers found what's the most important question you can ask yourself. Most people say when they're looking for uh, a, uh, you know, what to do with their lives, so they, the number one question they ask themselves is, what is my passion? What am I passionate about? Follow your passion. Whatever it is you're passionate about, go and do. It's the wrong question. Because if you follow your passion, I see Hani Grunstein agrees with me here, right? If you follow your passion, then the entire world centers around you, right? There's me, there's my passion, and everyone else has to kind of navigate themselves around me and my passion. He says, researchers say, that's the wrong question to ask yourself. You should be asking yourself, what can I contribute, right? What is my greatest contribution? And once you see what you can contribute to your coworkers, to your family, to the world around you, that is what you should spend your life doing. What can be my greatest unique contribution that nobody else around me can make? So it's not what's my passion, which centers around me and puts me at the center and everyone else on the outside. No, it's what is my greatest contribution that I can give to the people around me? And therefore, it's not me in the center, it's them in the center, and it's me building upon that. That is Sphiris Omer. Sphiris Omer doesn't ask us as we build to Shavuos and as we're working on self-improvement, which is really what Sphira is all about, the 49 days to improve ourselves. It's not asking ourselves, what am I passionate about? What am I good at? Right? No. It's asking yourselves the Sphiris Omer question, Mi Macharat HaShabbat. God gave us gifts. God gave us this world. Hashem handed certain talents to us. And now our question is, what do I do with that to contribute to the world around me? What do I give back? How am I perfecting Hashem's imperfect world? Because that's ultimately what Hashem demands of us. And so in our 30 short minutes, three ideas, 30 minutes, that's what has become our minna here on Friday mornings. And I'm glad to see that we've grown as each Friday comes. But in our 30 minutes here, on Friday morning, we saw three magnificent ideas. Number one, that money does grow on trees as long as it's connected to its source. Number two, that horses can count. You know why? Because like our children, they're very in tune to unconscious cues. And number three is that we get to be like Hashem. Hashem gave us this beautiful, magnificent world. Hashem gave us so many gifts and talents, but he wants us not just to keep them to ourselves, but he wants to empower us to use it to contribute to others, and ultimately to perfect an imperfect world. I want to wish everyone a beautiful Shabbos. And again, always to stay safe, stay strong, and most importantly, to always be besimcha. Everyone have a beautiful, beautiful Shabbos.